Careless roll. Hello, my name is Jude Sutman, and this is my thesis defense on UAV Deployable Sensing Network for Rapid Structural Health Monitoring. So we're going to be starting by covering the outline. Starting with introduction, we're going to be talking about the project overview and the problem statement. We're going to be covering rapid structural health monitoring and technical challenges along the way. For methodology, uh, we look, we'll be covering deployment and retrieval system, sensor hardware and onboard systems, signal conditioning and error handling, and wireless sensing network in the context of structural health monitoring. Uh, for our experimentation, we're going to be covering a case study we did on a pedestrian bridge uh, behind the Toronto, Maine uh, using the UAV deployable wire sensing network for modal detection. Uh, for our results, we're going to be showing some time and frequency uh, response uh, data from the structure and some sensing system experimental challenges we faced uh, during the test and uh, we're going to be discussing outcomes of the system and some overview. And then for the conclusion, we're going to be looking into edge computing implementation and autonomous UAV delivery. So for our introduction, um, to, to cover the reason why uh, we took this effort, uh, with environmental disasters increasing in magnitude and frequency due to climate change, the safety of infrastructure uh, following extreme weather conditions becomes of a concern. Maintaining rapid structural uh, assessment capabilities in the aftermath of extreme weather conditions is essential uh, for disaster resilience and the longevity of critical infrastructure, where structural health monitoring systems uh, that are currently being used are stretched to their limit. Uh, due to the need for safer, faster, and more cost-effective solutions uh, for the challenge of high mobility sensing for rapid structural health monitoring applications. With uh, some background on rapid structural health monitoring, it's a, a real-time data-driven process by which insight into the stability or the health state of a structure is acquired. Um, during recent years, uh, the integration of uncrewed vehicles and wireless systems have been um, vital to uh, these rapid structural health monitoring systems. Uh, where the, the use of sorry the use of such uh, systems or technologies uh, raise uh, different challenges. So, for example, sensor placement and delivery using autonomous vehicles can be challenging. Uh, signal degradation due to mechanical transmissibility loss. Previously, uh, you had to have a technician mount the sensor or even uh, integrate the sensor into uh, the structure itself while being constructed. Uh, using high mobility sensors, you don't get that uh, benefit of, of mounting the sensor previous. So we have uh, this problem of signal degradation through uh, the sensor material itself. Um, basically, we're going to be covering that in detail later on. And uh, again, with wireless sensing networks, you fall into the challenge of uh, synchronizing and error handling during uh, wireless transmissions. So these are the new challenges that we try to fix through this work. Uh, the deliverables uh, throughout this work is going to be the deployment and retrieval system. We're going to be talking about that shortly. And then sensor hardware, uh, we're going to be breaking down what the sensor consists of. And then signal conditioning, some uh, techniques we use to increase the resolution of our sensor, lower signal noise ratio and uh, root mean squared error. Those are our metrics to evaluate how well we did. And sensing network for structural modal detection. We ran the case study and we're going to be showing how to use this network uh, to detect the first mode of this given bridge. So the electropermanent magnets that we use, those are vital to our work. Um, we started off by doing some uh, mapping of the um, 
basically surface of this uh, electropermanent magnet. And as you can see in the plot, uh, the, the way this magnet works is by, it conserves power by only consuming uh, power to engage or disengage the magnet with no steady state power consumptions. We can, uh, power consumption, we can turn off the magnet and it'll remain magnetized or demagnetized depending on the last command we've given it. Um, this is very beneficial in, in uh, high mobility sensing because you, ha you have very limited power on board and every little bit of power we get to conserve extends the uh, deployment period. So this is a deployment and retrieval uh, uh, basically trial here. You can see the sensor is on board and we have the electropermanent magnet on top and an electropermanent magnet in the retrieval guard and the sensor package is basically uh, fixed through the bottom magnet onto the drone currently until we approach the structure. As you can see, we had some flutter in the sensor package, but that got fixed later by increasing the stiffness of the uh, mount. So we engaged the top, disengaged the magnet, and we're able to release the sensor onto the bridge. Basically, we run our tests no, um, in, in different configurations. The way we had it currently set up is by running uh, periodic tests and collecting this data into uh, non-volatile memory. We're going to be covering the actual process later. But when it comes time to retrieve, we basically approach. And using the retrieval guards, it helps us guide the um, sensor package in this, to the center of uh, the, the base, where the, the electropermanent magnet is centered. And we have a ferrous plate on the bottom that helps us magnetize. We disengage the top, engage the bottom, and we're able to retrieve the system. Some features of the sensor package itself, uh, it's high mobility, robust sensor node. We have basically combined all the systems into uh, a very compact package uh, to be able to uh, lift it using a drone and not have um, payload issues. Aerially deployable, obviously, on non-invasive docking utilizing the EPMs. Uh, we discussed earlier the use of bolts or drill, having a drill into the structure or um, using glues that can stay on the structure afterwards. Uh, using electropermanent magnets kind of mitigate that problem. However, it raises the problem of transmissibility loss. Um, the, re the way we try to work around that is by having a separate uh, PCB basically with an uh, accelerometer on board and that minimizes the air, the basically the amount of material that the vibration has to travel through for the sensor to be able to pick it up. If we were to have the sensor on the main board, the transmissibility loss would be too much to pick up anything reasonable off of that. Um, our sensor can sample up to 28 kilosamples per second. Uh, this tends to be fast uh, for uh, ambient vibration monitoring. However, um, this, uh, we raised the sampling rate using zero peripheral interface that fast because we were looking into impulse responses previously. Um, but it was proven to not be as effective as just uh, listening to ambient vibration for a longer period of time. And uh, the sensor frame was designed with minimal transmissibility loss in mind, um, as we covered. So. Some, some technical uh, names of uh, the hardware we use. Uh, we have the ARM Cortex-M7, which is the processor we currently use on the microcontroller, which is a TNC 4.0. Uh, our microelectromechanical system accelerometer, which is an SCA 3300D01, and uh, an electropermanent magnet V3R5C from Nika Drone. Uh, we ended up using non-volatile memory um, on board the sensor package because, again, we're trying to conserve as much power as possible in non-volatile memory. After you've written into it, you can turn off power and not lose any of that. Um, we obviously went with lithium polymer. It's uh, for battery uh, or power storage because it's the 
relatively higher density uh, for, for a lighter weight package, which is optimal for aerial deployment. And finally, our NRF uh, 24LL1 Plus, which is the bread and butter of the sensor network uh, system. We're going to be discussing that a little later in the, pro in the presentation. So some um, background of how we developed our uh, machine learning filter to be able to comp compensate for error. Um, goodness. All right. All right. Um, we use this electro, uh, electromagnetic shaker uh, to induce a known excitation signal, which was a chirp in this uh, experiment. We're more interested in the frequency domain of, uh, rather than the time domain, um, so that the ch that's why we chose the chirp excitation to train the model with. As you can see, this is the known uh, input excitation, and this is the uh, accelerometer response that we see out of that. Um, as you can see, the higher the frequency, the higher the, ex uh, the acceleration. Um, we're going to be trying to train with the lowest, uh, with, with the lower end of um, frequencies. That's that's kind of where the transmissibility loss happens the most. Uh, and uh, two equations that we've used as metrics are signal to noise ratio in decibel and root mean squared error. So moving to training, uh, we adopted a 50-unit single-layer LSDM network uh, that we trained with multiples of those data sets that I showed earlier. Uh, these are the equations uh, that govern the LSDM model. And what we try to do is feed it basically the raw data from the sensor package and compensate for it through uh, the previously supervised learning um, data sets and then we're, we produce a enhanced signal in this case, rejecting noise and any biases that happen. Oh, and uh, the model uh, updates, uh, basically back propagates every 400 uh, samples, which is a second. So uh, a few results from that experiment. Um, this is not the main results of the work. However, it helps us get a better uh, signal for our case study later on, so I presented them now. Um, long story short, we're able to enhance the signal to noise ratio by 9.34% um, and our um, RMSC of roughly 19.66. Um, we also can see here we were able to push the uh, usable, that this is a frequency response function. So when we're around one, that means our input and output are the same, so that the, basically we have minimum error, and we set our threshold to be 2%. Uh, anything above 2% becomes unusable. So using this model, we were able to push the usable limit down to 1.37 hertz. How we use this, or intend to use this uh, sensing network, um, Basically, we have our structure. In this case, it was a simple beam just to uh, show the system. Uh, we provide a known excitation. Um, our senior design team last year built this uh, shaker that we used for the case study. We give a known frequency excitation, and we listen to the response, as you can see here. Um, this is just uh, model data, but we'll be able to see real data later on. We give it a known excitation, and we listen for the response and see where the structure wants to naturally vibrate at. And in, in that case, we can say this is, uh, if all three sensors agree to that peak, that means we've captured mode one, in this case. The, uh, a little bit on the sensor network background, uh, the enhanced shock burst protocol uh, is what we've used as a backbone for this wireless sensing system. Uh, it allows, a, it, it's a 2.4 gigahertz protocol with uh, two megapixels, megabits per second um, transfer rate. Uh, and we're able to connect to, uh, this is kind of a neat uh, 
device that allows you to transceive means transmit and receive in using the same module and we can link up to six uh, nodes at a time where the flowchart of how we execute a um, measurement where we start by initializing the system, we deploy the sensor package, and then once they're on, they're scanning for a wireless trigger that either the drone can send or we can send ourselves using uh, this long-range transmitter. Uh, once the sensor package receives a trigger signal, it starts collecting vibration data into a buffer. Uh, we went with a buffer because we wanted as consistent of a sampling rate as possible, and if we access memory with every sample, that might uh, cause inconsistencies. So whenever we fill up the buffer, which is about 74,000 samples, we go into uh, vo non-volatile memory, and that's stored permanently. And then we put the uh, sensor package in standby mode until the next trigger signal. Uh, this is some uh, data from the experiment. What we did is uh, we deployed three of those sensor nodes onto the bridge in places where uh, we used a finite element model to kind of determine a rough uh, shape of the, the mode we're, liking, we're trying to pick up. And as you can see here, um, the, the structure, given the excitation from the shaker, tends to vibrate at, uh, like as you see, re the response amplifies uh, when we hit the resonant frequency, and then it dies back out after we surpassed it. So that's kind of... Uh, what uh, we follow in the time domain signal to be able to determine where we're at with nodes or mode shapes. Um, to, to go through the results, uh, this is the experimental setup. As you can see, the nodes are connected to the bridge. We have our long range wireless antennas ready to pick up a signal. We send a wireless trigger. And uh, this is after sweeping through zero to 15 hertz, we're able to get a time domain response that looks like this out of the uh, three nodes that we had on the bridge. And our main concern is is this peak right here. Um, that's where we captured our first mode. And if we take a look at the frequency uh, response, as discussed earlier, you can see the red, the yellow, and the green, uh, the blue uh, lining up, uh, indicating that this is our first lecture mode. And then to validate that further, uh, we run a spectrogram. And as you can see, we have our highest response at uh, about 11 hertz. That agrees with FFT. So sensing system experimental challenges, uh, we set a threshold uh, for the frequencies we're trying to pick. Uh, a 10 microsecond, uh, basically, response, uh, sorry. 10 microsecond latency between the sensor nodes would indicate a failed experiment because at that point uh, the phase shift gets too significant that we're picking up different events at different times and it gets challenging to line these up. Uh, so 80, about 85% of our sensor uh, latency happened below that threshold which uh, helped us um, line up the, the responses more accurately. And then uh, the lower frequency, uh, low magnitude, uh, basically signals that can be mitigated by a few approaches, one being uh, sampling for longer periods or combining uh, data sets. So at this point, we're limited with our buffer size, and it's a hardware limitation. Um, moving forward, this can be expanded by adding an external buffer or switching the microcontroller or something more powerful. As for a conclusion, uh, we basically covered the deployment and retrieval system, the sensor hardware and onboard systems, signal conditioning and error compensation using our uh, long short-term memory comp error compensator um, that we looked into uh, edge implementation of. Uh, the it was feasible up until the, the date of this study. Um, we haven't really implemented it uh, currently on this version of the sensor package, but we aim to do it for the next iteration. 
And as we spoke about the wireless sensing network and uh, its ability to detect uh, the modes uh, of a bridge, as our case study covered. Um, acknowledgement, I want to thank the Air Force and the NSF for making this work possible. And any questions?